The following radio program is for informational purposes only and is neither specific nor tailored financial advice to any individual. It is not intended as an offer or solicitation for the purchase or sale of any financial instrument. Always do your own due diligence and consult a financial advisor before making any investments. Investing involves risk, which can result in the loss of any or all principal. Peter Weitz is a registered investment advisor with Fusion Analytics Investment Partners, LLC, an SEC-registered investment advisor as well as a registered rep with Fusion Analytics Securities, LLC, a FINRA registered broker-dealer and SIPC member. All views expressed in this program are those of the host or guests and do not reflect the opinions of Fusion Analytics Investment Partners nor its affiliates. Your investments. How secure are you that they are secure? Do you want to know more about investing, retirement, and moving to the next level in business? Welcome to In Black and Whites, featuring host Peter Whites. Our program will answer all of the questions about your future and so much more. It's all about smart business and smarter investing. Now, here is your host, Peter Whites. Hi, thanks. Welcome back to the program. I'm your host, Peter Whites. Thank you to Mark Schlossberg for being last week's guest. Uh, I know I learned a lot about uh, the wine industry as a whole, and it was uh, very timely in light of the earthquakes that took place in California uh, a couple days prior to his visit. Today we are going to talk about something a little bit different, um, and I've been getting a lot of emails and questions about this, so I've kind of been putting it off, and I put together a show that would reflect it, but uh, I'm titling the show How Bad Luck and Bad Assumptions Can Lead to a Bad Retirement Outcome. Uh, and obviously the best laid plans, as we've been heard in many times in the past, uh, can certainly lead to great outcomes, but sometimes luck does factor in. And just like anything else, uh, particularly in with investments, luck is part of the puzzle. You know, I'd like to tell you that we're smart all the time, but we're not. Um, sometimes we really need a little bit of luck on our side. Um, so I just want to, you know, start it out with a, with a quick story. Uh, people in, uh, and they always often asked the Orlando, Florida resident, and that's important to point out, Arnold Palmer, why he continues to be so active, particularly as he gets older. And his response was, what am I going to do, retire, move to Florida and play golf? Well, the funny part is it is funny, but middle-aged Americans are beginning to follow the same path as Palmer. And according to new reports by a, a website called Hearts and Wallets, which is a retirement research firm, more than half, 55% of Americans – aged 53 to 65, say they plan to continue working full-time as long as their health permits. And that's up from 51% from last year. And among full-time workers over 65, 46% plan to continue working full-time and 41% at least half-time or part-time. So we're finding that a lot more of Americans today are following that Arnold Palmer mantra, uh, what am I going to do, retire, move to Florida and play golf, when instead they're actually working into their later years. Uh, And I'm going to give you some reasons as to why I think that's the case in just a moment. But following suit along those lines, middle-aged Americans also have higher level of investor anxiety than other age groups. And the the study goes on to say that in mid-2013, 42% of investors age 45 to 54 reported having moderate to high anxiety with only 30% feeling it's secure. The anxiety they think stems from a shaky U.S. economy, uh, the potential financial crises going on in Europe and automated trading, which investors feel distort stock prices and other investment tricks. So uh, this is what the report studies have shown. Uh, And it looked, uh, just to give you an idea, the study looked at Americans aged 40 to 60 I found that investors are unable to tell the difference between a full-service brokerage firm, uh, such as the big wirehouses that we've heard of, and self-directed firms uh, such as Scott Trade or Vanguard. Um, they're indistinguishable in terms of service, price, product, quality, uh, even though some are considered, quote, self-service and some are considered, quote, full-service. So the bottom line in, in the opening of this remark is that, number one, Americans plan on working f- fully – through their lifespan, not necessarily, quote, retiring, uh, but slowing down and continuing to work maybe less hours, but always drawing an income as part of their plan. And at the same time, investors, uh, particularly today, are more nervous uh, than they had been in the past with regards to what's going on in the world and, and their investments. 
And then the last thing is that they really haven't quite embraced the value of a financial professional with regards to their practice. So that kind of frames out some of the highlights of what I want to talk about today. But before I do, let's get into uh, some of the statistics and some of the why. Well, I think the first reason that people are continuing to work later into the retirement years is simply because they haven't saved enough. Uh, I know when I speak about that, I can speak to almost all of you that are listening that, you know, and I can say that there are really two types of money, some and not enough. And for those that have not enough, we need to figure out why. Well, many people assume that they can hold off saving for retirement and they can make up the difference later. But it turns out that this is actually really costly and a costly mistake. Waiting too long to start saving, okay, uh, can make it very difficult to catch up as you only have a few years left to make big differences in how much you accumulate, meaning that you have to take bigger risks later on if you want to accumulate the same amount of growth that you would in earlier years. Uh, so, so let me give you an example um, so that you can understand exactly what I'm talking about. And, and I want to say start saving uh, as soon as you can, as much as you can, because it is never too late, uh, but you definitely want to make sure you continue to save. The earlier you start, however, the longer compounding, which is a, a, a very widely used financial term, works for you in your favor. So let me give you an example. Let's say a 20-year-old gets out of college or a 21-year-old gets out of college and out of the box starts saving $200 per month until age 65, okay? And let's just for the sake of my argument say that that same, you know, uh, a newly employed 21-year-old earns a modest uh, 6% return annually uh, on his or her investments, okay? At age 20, starting at age 20, that person will have accumulated at 65 $550,000 for retirement. Now, that's $550,000 for retirement that's based solely on saving $200 a month for their entire working career. That's it, $200 a month. All right, but let me make the example a little more interesting. If they started saving at the age of 30, that same $200 per month. So basically waiting the first 10 years or not saving in the first 10 years of their employment, right? Started saving at age 30. That 550,000 at age 65, age 65 goes to 285,000, roughly half. Okay? That first 10 years of savings cost you half of your retirement income. That's how important the first couple of years are because those years are compounding for the full 35 years of investments and each year that you don't save cuts off another year of the full amount to compound. So if you start at 30, the maximum amount you can compound is 25 years. It gets even more interesting. That same $550,000 that a 20-year-old put away saving $200 per month, now you start at the age of 40 saving $200 per month. At the age of 40, you'll have accumulated by 65, 100 and $38,000. That's all. And if you want to get really crazy, if you started saving at the age of 50, you'll have about $58,000, dollars So my first point is start saving early. And that's really what's going to make up this difference. And potentially goes back to my original uh, statistic of 55% of Americans say they're going to continue to work through their retirement age or at least past the age of 65. Perhaps if they started saving when they were 20, they wouldn't have such angst about how they're going to save, wouldn't have to have the pressure of having to generate so much in return and may not have such anxiety with regards to the markets. So that's my first point is to start saving early. And I think that's the first reason why we're finding how some bad assumptions can lead to some bad outcomes in the market. The first bad assumption is you haven't saved. So let me take it to another level, okay, and talk about – so that's, that's savings on your own personal level. But as you know in this show, uh, I focus on 
401k plans and retirement planning. And because of that, I want to talk about what's going on in the 401k world. So the vast majority, if not all of you listening, have an employer-sponsored 401k plan. Um, and if you don't, shame on you or your employer. But that 401k plan has has gives you the ability to save either pre- or post-tax dollars into a vehicle, which oftentimes is accompanied by an employer match in that you give X amount per year out of your income and your employer matches that same X amount up to some threshold of, of a percentage of your annual income. However, let's go back to the data. The average worker of 22 years of age, okay, just starting out, has no money contributed to the 401k plan. The average 23-year-old uh, saves around eight grand or has about eight grand in balance. So they're starting to save. Okay. But now let's go on up. If you were to average, okay, putting away $8,000 a year in your first year and then work your way up every year towards the maximum retirement. Here's what you could potentially have, okay? If you followed that philosophy, okay, of a minimum of 8,000, a maximum of 17,500, and you started when you began working, okay, in your 401k plan, at the age of 65, you basically worked 44 years. You would have, uh, if you averaged 8,000 a year, 740,000 in retirement. And if you average 17500 a year, maxing out your current 401k plan, you would have around $3.5 million. Okay, this is based upon using the same 6% modest rate of return. So let me reemphasize that, okay? For those that haven't saved, if you started saving at the age of 22 and you saved for your entire working career, $17,500 a year and you got used to living without it, then you would actually have $3.5 million available for retirement. Now let's compare the assumptions to reality. Okay? I mentioned that if you saved, again, and maxed out your 401k plan, every year that you worked, you'd have $3.5 million. So a 65-year-old today, that's about what we can assume they would have. However, here's the reality. The average Generation Y person at the moment whose age is 22 to 34 has an average account balance, and this is as of March 31st of this year, of $16,500. The average Gen Xer, which is 35 to 48, has an average account balance of 63500 Baby boomers age 50 to 67, you have an average account balance of $126,000. And essentially all people over the age of 55, if we were to group them, have an average balance in their 401k plan of 150000 So going back to my original comment of why are people going to work into retirement, it's because they have no choice. People 55 and older have only saved $150,000 in their entire working career. And that is where the problem begins. We're going to take a deeper look into how we can fix this problem. And I'm going to give you some more statistics on why it actually exists. We're going to do that in just a minute. You're listening to the In Black and Whites radio program on the Voice America Business Network. When it comes to business, you'll find the experts here. Voice America Business Network. ERISA 408B2. Fiduciary standards. Safe harbor? Fidelity bonds. Record keepers? Discrimination testing? I am so confused. Does your 401k plan have more questions than answers? 
Peter Weitz and his team of 401k experts have a solution. Their on-site service model distinguishes them from other service providers, and they are specialists in 401k costs, regulations, and compliance. If your 401k plan has more questions than answers, then contact Peter at 877-945-2888 or email him at peter at inblackandwhites.com. Climbing Mount Everest is an amazing feat, and many have died trying to do so. However, more people have died descending Mount Everest than in reaching the summit. Part of the problem may be that people are so focused on reaching their objective that they fail to plan appropriately for what they will do or should be prepared for afterward. Similarly, people are so focused on saving for retirement and reaching retirement that they fail to plan appropriately for what they will encounter once they have actually retired. With one out of every four 65-year-olds today living past the age of 90, you may be retired longer than you are actually working. Have you devised a plan, process, and discipline to ensure that you will not run out of money? If you are not sure what to do, then simply contact Peter Weitz and his retirement team at Fusion Analytics. We help manage human emotions using three proprietary investment techniques. Our job is to evaluate the forces that the typical investor can't see so that wealth is preserved and not lost. Find out more at inblackandwhites.com. Whites is spelled W-E-I-T-Z. Email Peter at inblackandwhites.com. In Black and Whites, we win by not losing. When it comes to business, you'll find the experts here. Voice America Business Network. You are listening to In Black and Whites. To reach Peter Whites or his guest today, please call 1-866-472-5790. That's 1-866-472-5790. You may also send an email to peter at inblackandwhites.com. Whites is spelled W-E-I-T-Z. Email Peter at inblackandwhites.com. Now, back to this week's program. Hi, thanks. Welcome back to the program. I'm your host, Peter Whites. Prior to the break, I was talking about 401k savings and overall savings, but I left you with the statistic that said that the average 401k balance, and uh, I point this out, this is very important, the average 401k balance, had you saved for retirement, maxing out what the government allows you to at 17500 from the beginning of time when you began working, which I know is a little unrealistic because your salary is lower, but just for the sake of this discussion, you'd have $3.5 million in the bank uh, versus uh, what I read were some staggering statistics of, at the moment, baby boomers, which are those age 50 to 67, have less have just over $126,000 saved for their entire retirement. And so I followed along a quote by Avaro Palmer saying that he was going to you know, not want to retire, play golf, and move to Florida, even though that's what he does. But I, I followed up on that because it, the, the statistics are showing that people are working longer and the reason they're working longer is specifically for these reasons. So it leads – when I have this discussion with, with people regarding retirement – and the fact that they haven't saved enough, it leads into a conversation of, wow, I'm going to take all my money and I'm going to invest it today in the stock market so that I can be as aggressive as I possibly can and make up that difference as much as I possibly can. Well, this is sort of where the the bad luck, bad outcome scenario kind of plays into the mix. The problem is you may have the best returns, but you might have the wrong timing. And th- there's, a, there's a very popular financial uh, study that was done. It's called the sequence of returns. And I was going to give a very convoluted and complex example of how it works, but I'm going to break it down even easier. Um, for those that have been to the Las Vegas casinos or other casinos around the world or the country, um, you know, perhaps you've played a game of blackjack. And what's interesting is that everything that I'm taught in uh, in the fi- in financial principles are all really based upon casinos. It's just that the roles are reversed, so that when I'm when I'm financial modeling for my clients, when I'm coming up, you know, potential outcomes and scenarios, I'm essentially the house. I'm pretending that my client is actually the casino. My client is Caesar's Palace, and 
those that are coming uh, to gamble in my client's casino are really the investment outcomes uh, that I come up with. And, and I explain it that way because of this. If I were to walk into the casino with $1,000 to gamble and I was going to play $100 a hand at blackjack and I lost the first five hands, right, I'd be down $500. What if I won the first five hands? Well, if I won the first five hands, I'd be up $500. So the point is, is that now, in order for me to get back to even in scenario A, I have to win the next five hands, which is not likely. So what's going to happen is I'll win two, get back to seven, lose one, be down to six. On the other scenario where I win the first five hands, I'm now at $1,500, I win the next two, I'm at $1,700, and I lose the next two, and I'm back to $1,500, and then I lose the next three, and I'm at $1,200. Well, I've lost five, I've lost the same six hands that I lost in scenario A, but I have a difference of $600 in scenario A versus $1,500 in scenario B. So investors go through uh, a life stage during which you know, you make contributions and your accounts go up or down um, and so forth. But if you were to look at the sequence of returns, I could actually show you two different sets of circumstances. Account A is what I'm going to call positive to negative. And account B is negative to positive. And if I were to take a snapshot of an account and use the same exact returns over a 10-year period, so each year, there's the same set of returns, okay? And those returns averaged the same amount over 10 years. So in this particular example, I averaged a 5.4% rate of return, okay? And I'm going to make my math very simple. I used a million dollars to start. So for those listening, follow my logic real quick, and then I'll sum it all up where it makes sense. If I have a million dollars... And in year one, I made money for the first six years, seven years, and lost money for the last three, okay? So my returns, I averaged across the board 5.4% over a 10-year period. But I was positive in my returns for the first seven years and negative for the last three. My million dollars would be worth $1.6 million. Okay, now let's take the other hand. If I had the same 5.4% return and I lost money in the first three years and made money in the last seven, okay, same exact scenario but flipped, right? If I lost money in the first three years and made money in the next seven, I would have my million dollars would be worth $1.1 million. Those three years in the beginning where I lost money cost me 500000 30% of my total value over time because of what's called the sequence of returns, because of the way the returns worked. Now, do I know every year is going to be a positive or a negative? No, and a lot of that can attribute to some bad luck. However, I can mitigate that bad luck through careful and prudent investing. So I bring that up because it's important to understand why we don't have what others have or why some people's accounts go up more than others. And for those that have been an active listener uh, to this show, you'll know um, and you, you'll hear on a lot of the advertisements uh, throughout the show that we win by not losing. And what does that really mean? Well, for those that don't take the losses, okay – you're going to have more money in the long run than for those that do. And so if I can avoid the losses in an account, I don't need to make as much money on the upside because I've mitigated the downside. And so if you follow, again, going back to the sequence of returns, if I can start an account out with gains, then I can afford losses as opposed to starting an account in investments with losses first, and that's critical. So the sequence of returns 
is definitely something that's an important factor into helping you with the right assumptions as to how you want to invest. But let's go, let's drill down on that and the sequence of returns. Let's, let's figure out why exactly the sequence of returns exists and why I bring it up as a point. It's pretty simple, okay? People want to think they're smarter than the market. People want to time the market. People want to believe in hunches and hypotheticals and supposition. And if you f go back to my gambling example, sitting down at the blackjack table, okay, no one has a plan, a process, and a discipline. But if you did, you could mathematically beat the casinos. It would be dull. It would be boring, uh, but it's certainly possible. So think about it this way. I'm going to give you two ways that that happens. You'll never do this, but you can't because if you have a if you, mathematics or mathematics, all right, you can do two things. The average person sits down at a casino table for 45 minutes. So now if you reverse your hat and remember that you're the house, the house wants you to stay there longer because time is the friend of the house. The longer you sit there, the more money the house is going to make. Similarly, when you're an investor, the longer you have a time horizon to invest, the more money you're going to make. Same, same concept as a casino. So if you were to figure out a way to go to a casino, play three hands of blackjack and leave every single day, from a timing perspective, over time, you would beat the casino because they don't have the ability to grab your money. That's what's called timing the market. It's a big no-no. Do not time the market. You can't pick when the market's going to win and when the market's going to lose. So as an investor, if you went into the casino and you picked three days or three hands and played three hands and left, win or lose, in the long run, you'd win money. You would, you would beat the casino because they don't have time to get it back. They don't have time to figure out. They don't know that the three hands that you're going to win are the three hands that you play at that time. But if you win them all, you have 100% return on your money, you leave. That's that. Conversely, if you were to stay the average 45 minutes, the likelihood is, is the casino odds are going to swing in your favor. So put your casino hat on, put your gambling hat on when you're investing and pretend that you're the house. The second thing that is important in gambling, okay, is in mathematics, is that if you were to double your bet every single bet, you would never lose money ever. It's mathematically impossible. Now, it requires a pretty hefty bankroll, but you would do very well, and I'm sure the casinos would frown upon it because they have no chance of taking your money. Let me give you that example. You sit down at the blackjack table, you bet $10. If you lose, you're down 10 so now you've doubled your bet. You bet $20. If you win, you're back to even. Now you double your bet to $40. If you lose, you're down $40. You double your bet to $80. If you win, you're back to even. But let's reverse it the other way around. Now you bet $10. You win, you're up $10. You double your bet to $20. Right? You win that, you're up $30. You double that $20 bet to $40. You win, you're up $70. So you're continuing to grow the amount of money you make. If you lose, simply double the bet. You have to double the bet every single time. Why do I tell you this? It's not a show about gambling. This is a show about prudent investing. And if you follow the math and the statistics of casinos and you wear your hat as if you were a casino, you will win by being methodical, having a process, a plan, and a discipline. Casinos can't beat you if they think you're timing the market. So if they know that you're going to play one or two hands, you're going to win. They also know if you continue to double your bets, mathematically you're going to win. So if you think about it, don't try to time the market. You will do very well as an investor. So remember the, the hat you have to wear. You wear the hat of the casino. When I get back, I'm going to talk about how that makes a huge difference in timing the market. And I'm going to do that in just a minute. You're listening to the In Black and White's radio program on Voice America Business. From the boardroom to you, Voice America Business Network. Climbing Mount Everest is an amazing feat, and many have died trying to do so. 
However, more people have died descending Mount Everest than in reaching the summit. Part of the problem may be that people are so focused on reaching their objective that they fail to plan appropriately for what they will do or should be prepared for afterward. Similarly, people are so focused on saving for retirement and reaching retirement that they fail to plan appropriately for what they will encounter once they have actually retired. With one out of every four 65-year-olds today living past the age of 90, you may be retired longer than you are actually working. Have you devised a plan, process, and discipline to ensure that you will not run out of money? If you are not sure what to do, then simply contact Peter Weitz and his retirement team at Fusion Analytics. We help manage human emotions using three proprietary investment techniques. Our job is to evaluate the forces that the typical investor can't see so that wealth is preserved and not lost. Find out more at inblackandwhites.com. Weitz is spelled W-E-I-T-Z. Email Peter at inblackandwhites.com. In Black and Whites, we win by not losing. ERISA 408B2, fiduciary standards, safe harbor, fidelity bonds, record keepers, discrimination testing. I am so confused. Does your 401k plan have more questions than answers? Peter Weitz and his team of 401k experts have a solution. Their on-site service model distinguishes them from other service providers, and they are specialists in 401k costs, regulations, and compliance. If your 401k plan has more questions than answers, then contact Peter at 877-945-2888 or email him at peter at inblackandwhites.com. Voice America Business Network. The bottom line in business. You are listening to In Black and Whites. To reach Peter Whites or his guest today, please call 1 866 472 5790. That's 1 866 472 5790. You may also send an email to peter at inblackandwhites.com. Whites is spelled W-E-I-T-Z. Email Peter at inblackandwhites.com. Now, back to this week's program. Hi, thanks, 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 thanks. Welcome back to the program. I'm your host, Peter Whites. Uh, at the break, I was uh, was posed with the question of what what are some of the things I could do if I don't have a 401k plan? Because, you know, obviously we spoke in an earlier segment about how much people can save uh, and not having that vehicle. What can I do? Well, there's a couple things you can do. Number one, um, you can open up an IRA, which allows you to put away five thousand or fifty five hundred dollars a year this year. Um, other things you can do uh, there, there's a a campaign going on around the country uh, called Feed the Pig, and there's a a website called feedthepig dot org, um, and what it talks about is, is is really paying yourself first. So if you're able to have the discipline, and you know the beautiful thing about a 401k plan is the money comes out of your pay, and you don't have to see it. And so, since you don't see it, you don't don't know that it exists. And because of it, you're able to adjust your lifestyle to live without it, and it's it allows you to save more. Um, but for those that don't you, you don't have that, you need to be disciplined. And if you follow like the feedthepig.org scenario, uh, it teaches you how to save or pay yourself first. So consider yourself a vendor. Um, give yourself X amount of dollars as a payment, like a car payment or a phone payment, uh, and pay yourself and put that money somewhere into, into a savings plan or something. So there are options out there. Uh, you just need to make sure you talk uh, to your qualified financial professionals who can help you with it. So what I was talking about before the break was how you know life is, is, is funny because we, we know the casinos make a lot of money. And what are the reasons why? Well, the reasons why are, are based on time and statistics. And discipline, and uh, obviously they're not building multi-billion-dollar casinos because they're losing money. So how do we win more like casinos? Well, you have to think like them, and if you do, you'll win. So let me tell you exactly why I say that. There's often been people that quote try to time the market, and and what do I mean by time the market is that they try to figure out when the market's going to go up, when the market is going to go down. And they try to buy and sell, buy and sell to beat that. Similarly, like when they play blackjack, they think they're going to win the next hand. 
so they double their bet or they think they're going to lose the next hand so they make a smaller bet. Well, the cards don't know that you won or lost, nor does the casino. It's merely based on statistics and a little bit of luck. So picking the wrong time to get out or picking the wrong time to get in can make a significant impact on on what happens to your return. And so I'm going to give you a quick statistic and I'm going to go back to it because I want to explain why. Dalbar, which is a company that studies investor behavior, okay, it analyzed investor market returns and it looked at, you know, some of their research recently showed this. For tw- the 20 year period ending uh, December of 2014, or 13 rather, December 31st, 2014. So for the 20 years prior to that, starting in 1993, okay. The S&P index averaged 9.22%. So if you bought the S&P 500 index on January 1st of 1993 and you held it until December 31st of 2013, you would have averaged a 9.22% our annual rate of return over that entire period. It's not bad. It's a pretty good return over time. But the average investor over that same period averaged 5.2%, almost half. Well, the reason, it's pretty simple. They have no idea what they're doing according to a Wall Street Journal, uh, Wall Street Journal columnist, uh, Howard Gold. He said they don't have any idea what they're doing. And I'm going to tell you really why – and I'm going to get back to that in a minute – but why they don't know what they're doing and what that means. Go back to my blackjack example of I think I'm going to win the next hand or I've lost the last three hands in a row. I've got to win the next hand because I can't keep losing hand after hand after hand. That's not a strategy. That's a, that's a hypothetical. That's a supposition. And prudent investing doesn't work that way. So if you were to actually mix to, or go back to this example of the S&P 500 that I just gave you from 1993 to 2013, the 10 best days, the 10 largest grossing days of that time period account for 50% of the performance on the upside, 50%, the 10 best days. So here's some statistics. If I put in $100,000, okay, and in 1993, at the end of 2013, if I did nothing, the classic buy and hold strategy, nothing, just put the hundred grand in and let it sit. We said we averaged nine point two two percent compounded for twenty years. That amount ends up to three hundred and twenty four thousand dollars. That's what I'll have in value. If I tried to time the market, and I thought that uh, you know, like it is now, or the S and P five hundred is at an all time high, the Dow is setting new records, and people are often saying, "Oh, it's got to pull back. I got to get out of the market because it's." It's gone up way too high, and that's just a hunch, but there's no empirical evidence that supports your theory. If you missed those 10 days that I mentioned where the 10 best days accounted for 50% of the performance over the 20-year period, if you pulled out of the market and missed those 10 days, your 100000 would be worth 156000 So over a 20-year period, you averaged – a five, basically a five percent return, a little bit less. But you made fifty six grand because you decided that the market was too hot and you had to get out. But let me make even a better point, and I'm going to get into this sort of active management versus passive management point in a little later in the show. But if you manage to avoid the worst ten days, put the best ten days aside. If you a man manage to avoid the worst 10 days in the market, your portfolio would be worth $692,000. Double what would have been if you just did the classic buy and hold. Double. So what do I take away from this? It's great if you can avoid the major drawdown days, those 10 worst days. But only if you do so without avoiding the upside. So somewhere in your portfolio, depending on how your, your portfolio is managed, 
you're going to fall within the range of one of these numbers. I tend to err more on the side of I'd rather capture some of the upside of those 10 best days but avoid all of the 10 worst days and build my portfolio around that that hypothetical. So my th- where that comes out is this. I mentioned that if you played three hands of blackjack and left and you won all three hands on any given day. So so try this out. You know, go to one of those free online tools, you know, play blackjack, play three hands a day. Play the same amount of money every day. Three hands and leave. Do it for a month. See how much money you would have. You'd be amazed at how, how much you beat the casino. But if you win three hands on that day, consider that winning the three best performing days of that day because you won all three times. Similarly, if you go in and you lose those three hands, you lose those three hands, you lost the three worst performing days. Somehow you've got to be able to figure out a way to mitigate that. And the only way you can do that is through research. So going back to this article that I talked about of why investors lose more than the markets because they just don't know what they're doing is because everything we do is based on a hunch. Study after study shows that when the market goes up in value, more money goes into the market. It's akin to think about it's akin to thinking like this. Imagine going to the to the store, going to the to the mall and buying something every time the price goes up. And then returning the merchandise when it's on sale and you're only rewarded back the sale price. No one does that. No one does that. We all do that when we invest, but we don't do that when we buy. We're negotiating car prices to get the lowest possible price we can. You never see an ad on television where it says, hey, run down to the car dealer. Our prices are going up this week. Make sure you'll buy because no one's going to do that. But yet when we invest, that's exactly how we invest. So when you think about investing, think about going to the mall and buying something on a, at a price. And when it goes up in price, you buy it again. And when it goes up in price, you buy it again. But then you decide you don't need three or four of that pieces of merchandise, so you bring it all back. And you bring it back when it went on sale, and they give you a lower price. That's what makes investors uneducated. We, the, the behaviors that we experience in the real world, we don't use when we invest because it's driven by our greed. We feel that it'll never end. This happened in the housing crisis. When housing prices are going up 20% a day, everybody's getting into real estate saying, hey, I'll never lose money. But the fact of the matter is, is that there's no strategy to that. There's no, there's no statistics that prove that the housing market's going to continue to grow. So you have to be an educated investor. You have to be prudent. You have to be safe. And you have to be smart. And so our irrational behaviors cause investor market returns to be substantially less than what we would expect if we just followed the index. And this leads into a, uh, another topic, and I've covered it on a prior show called Behavioral Finance, um, and it's a really interesting topic talking about how we think when it comes to money. Uh, but you know, what would the, – the question I'll pose and I'll answer is what would, po- what would make or what would cause an investor to exhibit such poor judgment knowing that you could get a 9% return in the market but yet you're only getting five? Well, it's greed, and if you look at – the, if you look at when the markets go up and when the markets go down and the charts are staggering, and I'll post one about on this on my, on my uh, blog at the end of the program, the vast majority of money goes into the stock market when the stock market's running up to its highest levels. So you're seeing the vast amount of money going into the stock market today. Conversely, you see the most amount of money leave the stock market when the stock market's running low. And so when the markets are dropping like a rock, everybody's getting out. Why? Because they don't want to lose even more, but they're happy losing. So you've got to rearrange the way you think and go with, I'm going to buy when the markets are dropping like a rock and I'm going to sell when the markets are high. Don't look back. If you make money on something, you're never going to lose money. You know, uh, My partner always says to me, no one ever lost money taking a profit. So if you take something for a profit, take it. Don't worry about losing the rest of the money. That'll come back. 
When we come back from the break, I'm going to talk about ways to avoid losing money in your investments. And we're going to do that in just a minute. You're listening to the In Black and White's radio program on Voice America Business. Voice America Business Network, the bottom line in business. ERISA 408B2, fiduciary standards, safe harbor, fidelity bonds, record keepers, discrimination testing. I am so confused. Does your 401k plan have more questions than answers? Peter Weitz and his team of 401k experts have a solution. Their on-site service model distinguishes them from other service providers, and they are specialists in 401k costs, regulations, and compliance. If your 401k plan has more questions than answers, then contact Peter at 877-945-2888 or email him at peter at inblackandwhites.com. Climbing Mount Everest is an amazing feat and many have died trying to do so. However, more people have died descending Mount Everest than in reaching the summit. Part of the problem may be that people are so focused on reaching their objective that they fail to plan appropriately for what they will do or should be prepared for afterward. Similarly, people are so focused on saving for retirement and reaching retirement that they fail to plan appropriately for what they will encounter once they have actually retired. With one out of every four 65-year-olds today living past the age of 90, you may be retired longer than you are actually working. Have you devised a plan, process, and discipline to ensure that you will not run out of money? If you are not sure what to do, then simply contact Peter Weitz and his retirement team at Fusion Analytics. We help manage human emotions using three proprietary investment techniques. Our job is to evaluate the forces that the typical investor can't see so that wealth is preserved and not lost. Find out more at inblackandwhites.com. Weitz is spelled W-E-I-T-Z. Email Peter at inblackandwhites.com. In Black and Whites, we win by not losing. The business community's first choice in Internet talk radio. Voice America Business Network. You are listening to In Black and Whites. To reach Peter Weitz or his guest today, please call 1-866-472-5790. That's 1-866-472-5790. You may also send an email to peter at inblackandwhites.com. Whites is spelled W-E-I-T-Z. Email peter at inblackandwhites.com. Now, back to this week's program. Hi, thanks. Welcome back to the program. So I've spent today talking about this. I've talked about... Uh, why people have to work longer into retirement because simply they're not saving enough. And I gave you some statistics regarding how much people haven't saved, um, what the average saver has actually has in their bank and why it's important to to save. Well, then I talked about why uh, investors have bad outcomes, even though they have the best intentions, why they have bad outcomes. And a lot of it comes down to discipline. And I kind of want to give you in this last segment – Just a couple of things to think about to help you avoid some of those bad outcomes and make some – how to avoid some of those bad decisions. You know, prior to the break, we were talking about uh, behavioral finance and this whole study. Uh, And it would say, uh, you know, what would cause – I'm saying what would cause an investor uh, to exhibit poor judgment? Uh, After all, if you just put your money into a index fund for 20 years, you would have great performance rather than chasing – Performance, and that's kind of what I've been trying to explain: is that we tend to chase uh, the performance. We look for the best days and try to avoid them, but we always miss. So, the problem stems from human reaction, and the human reaction goes to either good or bad news. And when we hear good or bad news, regardless of what the news is, we overreact, uh, and as our emotional reactions cause illogical investment decisions. And this has been proven uh, through this study of behavioral finance. The tendency to overreact can become even greater during times of uncertainty, near retirement, for example, or when the economy is bad. That's when we get even worse. We become even more irrational, and we've seen that particularly dating back uh, to the 2008 market crash. 
So the study of behavioral finance documents and labels our money losing mind tricks with terms like recency bias and overconfidence. Well, recency bias is simple. We tend to think about what happened in 2008 and then we don't want to lose our – so I've got people that don't want to invest in the market because they're worried about a crash and they're still reeling in what happened in 2008. 2008 was six years ago, folks. It's almost seven years ago and we're still thinking about it. So our recency bias tends to impair our abilities. The stock market's up over 200 percent in the S&P since the lows of 2008, but we're still upset about losing our money, that we didn't take advantage of any of that. Overconfidence is the opposite. Overconfidence stems from everybody's getting into real estate. Since the housing market's going up so much, I'm going to go buy a bunch of houses and I'm going to flip them to all these other people and I'm going to make a fortune. And so those two alone tend to make people make poor investment decisions. So despite the research and education, right, this gap continues. And um, I want to tell you what you can do to potentially avoid uh, being – avoid that sort of fate of being the average investor, of being the investor that just doesn't know, you know what's happening. And so here's some, here's some of the ways uh, – to avoid money losing investment moves, things that you do that are just toxic. One of the best things to do to protect yourself is number one, obviously seek professional help and hire a financial professional. My emotions in your account are much different than your emotions in your account. And my goal is to make sure that not only do does your account grow, but more importantly that I protect you uh, from the things you can't see. If you want to remember, you go back all the way to the beginning of, uh, of this, this radio program. I talked about the movie The Blind Side. And in that movie, I pointed out that uh, the very beginning, Sandra Bullock had a soliloquy where she talks about Joe Theismann, uh, the quarterback of the Redskins at the time, taking a, a ferocious hit from Lawrence Taylor uh, and breaking Joe Theismann's leg in that hit in such a manner that he never played the game again. Well, the problem was is that when Joe Theismann went back to pass, he couldn't see over his shoulder. He couldn't see what was coming from behind. What was coming from behind was Lawrence Taylor. And so the argument that Sandra Bullock said is that a left tackle is probably the second most important person on the team after a quarterback. Well, you are your family's financial quarterback. I am your financial left tackle. It's my job to protect as a professional advisor. It's my job is to protect you from the things that you cannot see. That's what I'm trained to do. It's not to make you a fortune when the markets go up. It's to protect you from those 10 bad days in the market. So that's what an advisor can do. If you do not want to hire, hire an advisor and you want to do things on your own, okay, here are some rules that you might want to consider. Number one, do nothing. A conscious and thoughtful decision to do nothing is still – a form of action. All right. If you have your financial goals changed, if your portfolio was built around long term goals, a short term change in the markets should not matter. There's always going to be change. If there wasn't volatility in the market, there'd be nothing to buy, there'd be nothing to sell, and there'd be no growth. So doing nothing is absolutely okay as a strategy. The second thing is I want you to think about is your money's like soap. There's a famed economist named Gene Fama who said, your money's like soap. The more you handle it, the less you have. Okay, I want you to remember that. The more money, the less you have. Number three, never sell equities in a down market, ever. If your funds are allocated correctly, you never have to sell e equities during a down market. Holds true even if you're taking income. Just as you wouldn't run out and put a for sale sign on your home, when the housing market turns south, don't be rash to sell equities when the market goes through a bear cycle. Wait it out. Number four, and most importantly, science works. It's been academically proven that a disciplined approach to investing delivers higher market returns. I know it's boring, but it works. Go back to my example of playing three blackjack hands a day. It's boring, but it works. So if you don't have a discipline, you should not be managing your own investments. 
So that leads me to this. I got a question during the break that said, why don't I just buy the S&P 500 index and do nothing? You can, but as I mentioned to you, you if you put money in the market in, 2000 and, in 1993 and held it into 2013, that 20-year period, you had 350000 If you actually avoided the 10 worst days, you doubled that amount. You had almost 700000 And the reason is from active management. What active management does more than anything is it protects you from the potential of a down market. That's what it protects you from. Most good money managers are not going to necessarily outperform the markets when the markets are roaring like the S&P is right now. Very difficult to outperform the S&P 500 right now. However, there are several money managers out there that did tremendously better than the market when it lost 46% in 2008. And it's when you can avoid those 46% drawdowns that you can really make some money. So I don't need to make a 35 40% return on the upside if I can avoid that 45% return on the downside. I'm going to post a lot of the statistics from today's program on my blog. You can go to www.inblackandwhites.com and you can read some of those statistics and some of the reports that I cited. Uh, but I also advise you to seek financial professionals' help and assistance. Um, I am also happy to uh, field your phone calls in that regard. Uh, I'm going to tweet some of this information. I've been doing that, and I can tell that people are listening as I've already gotten a couple of questions about it. But again, have a disciplined approach so that your bad assumptions don't lead to bad outcomes. Let's take good assumptions and turn them into good outcomes. Thanks for listening. It's been a great program. You're listening to the In Black and White's radio program on the Voice America Business Network. Make it a great week. Thank you again for tuning in to In Black and Whites. Please join your host, Peter Whites, again next Tuesday at 10 a.m. Eastern Time and 7 a.m. Pacific Time for another edition of the program on the Voice America Business Channel. Have a safe week. <laughs>